I'll be talking about endemic fungal infections today. I have no disclosures, unfortunately. Um, so the objectives that I talked about with Dr. Morris, we're gonna identify the common fungal infections, uh, specifically in the US, identify the risk factors, talk about clinical presentation, how do we diagnose them, and what differential we should keep in mind, complications of disease, and how do we treat and monitor them. So this map um, is Medscape, but it comes from the CDC, and this is a general map of the distribution of the four major um, mycoses that we find in the US. So blasto, coccidiomycosis, histoplasmosis, and then cryptocotus gadi, which is in the Pacific Northwest, which I had actually not heard of before. Um, so starting with histoplasmosis, it's also known as cave disease, darling disease, Ohio Valley disease, spelunker disease. Um, it's caused by histoplasma uh, plasma capsulatum, which is an oval budding yeast, which that picture is supposed to be showing. It's thermally dimorphic, it's a mycelium in the environment, but morphs into a yeast in, at body temperature. It lives in the environment um, in soil, usually that contains bird or bat droppings. Um, histoplasma was first discovered in 1905 by Darling, but it wasn't really known to be a widespread infection until the 1930s. Before that time, um, most cases were misdiagnosed as TB and patients were actually put in sanatoriums and where they actually contracted TB <coughs> instead of being treated for histoplasmosis. Um, the location is worldwide, but most commonly in Central South America, Africa, Asia, Australia, doesn't narrow it down. Um, in North America, it's most common in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys or the Midwest. It is a reportable disease according to the CDC in the following states, and of note, Michigan, where we are now, is one of the states that if you have a case, it is to be reported. Um, there's a broad spectrum of disease, but patients who have severe disease that are at risk are uh, essentially the immunosuppressed, so patients with HIV and AIDS, um, status post organ transplant on immunosuppression, patients who are on steroids or TNF inhibitors for other um, illnesses, and infants. So again, this is a map from the CDC that kind of shows a little bit um, more clearly the, the area of um, endemic histoplasmosis. So the darkest region in the middle, that's the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley. That's where the most cases are reported. It does go up into Michigan a little bit and even as far west into California. And Dr. Morris also mentioned that when he was in North Dakota because the Missouri uh, River runs right through there, there are actually a lot of cases there as well. Um, the transmission is by inhalation of the microscopic spores. So people um, will have a history of disturbing the material, either digging in the soil or chopping wood um, where there are bird or bat droppings. People are exploring caves, cleaning chicken coops, or remodeling old buildings. There is an incubation period of three to 17 days after inhalation of spores before you may manifest any symptoms. And again, like I mentioned, the spectrum of disease is pretty wide. It can be anywhere from asymptomatic to severe systemic disease. The three major manifestations of symptoms are primary pulmonary histoplasmosis, progressive disseminated histoplasmosis, and then primary cutaneous histoplasmosis, which I won't spend a lot of time on, um, but just quickly, um, you can get skin lesions with disseminated histoplasmosis in up to 17% of patients, but the um, primary cutaneous form is very rare, and these patients usually have nodules, ulcers, or abscesses with regional adenopathy. Um, so histoplasmosis is the most common cause for hospitalization among the endemic mycoses. It has a mortality rate that's reported to be up to 8% in hospitalized adults according to the, uh, an article out of the, the Journal of Infectious Disease. Um, they also report a six month mortality rate of 4% with patients who have symptomatic histoplasmosis who do not require hospitalization. This map you will see a couple of times. It's a little bit old from 2002, but it just shows um, of the three major endemic mycoses, these are um, number of hospitalized patients per one million US persons. Although these numbers are small, you can see that histoplasmosis is the most common one, and they kind of go in descending order of how common they are. So, and that, um, and this um, was taken from a large database of hospital inpatient stays from the nationwide uh, inpatient sample. There, o it, it takes uh, information from over seven million his hospital discharges from over a thousand participating hospitals in 35 states. So, the diagnosis of histoplasmosis, um, you need to take a thorough history and see if the patients have appropriate exposure or if they have risk factors for the severe disease. 
Diagnosis can be done in a variety of methods. Histopathology, um, you will usually see granulomas or lymphohistiocytic aggregates or mononuclear cell infiltrates. So the top picture is a picture of a granuloma. Examination of the tissue, usually from a lung or from a lymph node with silver stain, will actually show the organism. So that is the um, bottom slide. It's the budding yeast, which you can see on silver stain. Culture is noted to be the most useful, especially for chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis. The sensitivity of respiratory cultures is much lower in localized disease or acute disease. And you um, typically require several samples from sputum or BAL. Um, it can be detected in up to 60 to 83% of patients with acute pulmonary histoplasmosis, depending on the extent of lung disease. But it, the sensitivity is, um, is higher in the pulmonary, chronic pulmonary disease. There is an antigen detection as well. You can test the blood, the urine, or BAL samples. Um, and there is also a serology. There's a complement fixation test and a diffusion test. Complement fixation is noted to be superior. Um, just of note, um, background seropositivity in endemic areas is not a major limitation for serologic testing. Um, there are reports that less than 1% of residents in endemic areas are seropositive on the immunodiffusion test, and less than 5% have positive complement fixation tests. So it shouldn't be a limiting factor with testing serology. But the only thing of note is that antibody assays can be falsely negative in immunosuppressed patients. And in the acute setting, um, antibodies sometimes don't appear until the second month after exposure. So if you do catch them early, the antibodies may not be positive when you first measure them. Um, of note also, the antibodies can remain positive for several years, so they may not always be a good indicator of disease activity. Um, so for pulmonary histoplasmosis specifically, the presentation is not very specific. They can have just kind of general flu-like symptoms on initial presentation, fever, malaise, cough, chest pain, nothing that should make anyone um, too concerned in the beginning. It's often self-limited, but certain um, cases are when you should start thinking about histoplasmosis. Again, if they're in the endemic region, but if patients have a pneumonia with lymphadenopathy, mediastinal hyalur lymphadenopathy, if they present with cavitary lung disease, if they have pericarditis with lymphadenopathy, um, pulmonary manifestations with arthritis and erythema nodosum, um, dysphagia or SBC syndrome or obstruction of other mediastinal structures, this is when you should start thinking about possibly that histoplasmosis could be the reason. So for pulmonary histoplasmosis, again, there is an acute diffuse pulmonary disease and a localized pulmonary disease. And this has, uh, it depends on the fungal burden of exposure. Patients who have a very high fungal burden, they often present with these diffuse infiltrates within a month following exposure, as you can see on this x-ray. For the localized pulmonary disease, these patients usually have an exposure to a lower fungal burden. Symptoms are often indolent lasting over a month, and they can often have a localized pulmonary infiltrate with uh, lymphadenopathy. And because of this kind of nonspecific presentation, you do still have to have on your differential from the run-of-the-mill viral illness and pneumonia to things like sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, and lymphoma, given the lymphadenopathy in the presentation. For pulmonary histoplasmosis, the treatment um, from the IDSA guidelines in 2007, they do recommend treatment for moderate to severe disease in patients who are exposed within a month. The treatment course is a total of 12 weeks. Um, amprotericin B is the load from three to five milligrams per kg for two weeks IV, followed by itraconazole for maintenance of therapy. There's an itraconazole load for three days, followed by BIV dosing for a total of 12 weeks. If patients have severe respiratory complications like hypoxemia or respiratory distress, um, the IDSA does also recommend methylprednisolone as an adjunct in the first few weeks um, for treatment uh, in addition to the antifungal therapy. You do need to monitor itraconazole levels. Um, usually you take the first level after two weeks to uh, ensure adequate drug exposure. And patients will need serial imaging to assess for resolution of pulmonary infiltrates. Um, the minimum treatment time is listed as 12 weeks. However, um, the treatment course can sometimes be extended uh, if the pulmonary infiltrates do not resolve. Disseminated histoplasmosis, this occurs in one out of every 2,000 patients who have an acute infection. 
It can be the result of a reinfection or reactivation of the infection. It's most common in immunocompromised patients, um, specifically AIDS patients, extremes of age, um, immunodeficiencies, or patients who are on immunosuppressants, so post-transplant or TNF inhibitors or steroids for other, um, for other reasons. Um, there was a study out of Europe with 72 HIV patients who um, presented with disseminated histoplasmosis, and this was reported to be, and 61% of them, this disseminated disease was actually their AIDS-presenting illness. The spectrum for disseminated histoplasmosis, there is an acute type of infection where patients, again, have kind of nonspecific fever, fatigue, hepatosplenomegaly, pancytopenia, but if they're severely immunodeficient, they can present in shock, uh, res respiratory distress, and multi-system organ dysfunction. If they progress to the chronic infection, they have pancytopenia, hepatosplenomegaly, they have GI lesions, which are reported to be ulcerations that tend to favor the colon and the ileum. Um, they can also have esophageal pain, difficulty swallowing. For the skin involvement, it's in up to, as I said before, 15 to 20 percent of patients um, with disseminated disease. And these are, they range from nodules, papules, plaques, down to abscesses. Um, and adrenal involvement is actually quite common. It's reported to be 80 to 90 percent on autopsy cases, although adrenal insufficiency is found in less than 10 percent of cases when they're diagnosed. Um, it's a perivasculitis that causes thrombosis and infarction of the adrenal gland and then thus causes adrenal insufficiency. The CNS involvement um, can occur in up to 20 percent of cases of disseminated histoplasmosis. Um, the clinical presentations are meningitis, focal brain lesions, or localized involvement of the spinal cord. So the treatment, this slide is a little bit more hefty, um, again from the IDSA guidelines. So um, treatment is recommended for all patients who have disseminated histoplasmosis. Again, there is an amphotericin B load followed by itraconazole. However, the treatment duration is much longer for a minimum of 12 months. Um, for patients who um, who are on who are going to be con continually immunosuppressed, lifelong suppressive therapy is recommended with itraconazole daily, um, despite patients who who have complete recovery. And this uh, um, A2 recommendation from the IDSA. Prophylaxis is also recommended in patients with HIV infection who have low CD4 counts under 150 in areas that are endemic where the incidence of histoplasmosis is reported as 10 cases per 100 patient years. So that kind of Ohio, Mississippi River Valley, that was the darkest green on the map would be the area for these types of patients. Again, monitoring, um, you need to monitor itraconazole levels after two weeks of therapy to make sure that you have good drug exposure. You can measure antigen levels um, during therapy and up to 12 months after therapy uh, is completed to monitor for relapse. If CNS, histo if CNS is involved for histoplasmosis and disseminated disease, um, the treatment that is recommended is actually higher doses of amphotericin for a longer load of four to six weeks and then followed by the itraconazole for a minimum of one year and also until CSF abnormalities, including the antigen levels, are, are cleared. So for monitoring, up to 20% of patients with chronic disease experience a relapse within two years of stopping the therapy. Reactivation is most common in the immunocompromised. Um, so follow-up should continue for at least, it's recommended for five years. In the first, two year, in the first year following um, completion of treatment, chest x-ray is recommended every six months followed by annual chest x-ray after that. Um, the chest X-ray findings um, often improve dramatically in, in the first year, and it's reported to be in up to two-thirds of patients, but sometimes they don't resolve completely, but treatment should not be discontinued until either there's resolution of the radiographic findings or stability of the improvement. So the reason that we're monitoring um, patients who have been treated for acute or disseminated histoplasmosis for a prolonged period of time is because of the sequelae that can develop. Um, the most common things that can be seen are chronic cavitary disease, fibrosing mediastinitis, broncholiths, nodules, and mediastinal granulomas. 
So this is a table um, from up to date, and this is interpreted from the IDSA guidelines. So we already talked about the treatment of the acute pulmonary disease, but going into the sequelae, so if patients have chronic cavitary pulmonary disease, it's recommended that patients have continued treatment with itraconazole for at least 12 months. If they have mediastinal granulomas and they're asymptomatic, um, these patients don't require treatment. However, if they do have pulmonary manifestations and symptoms, then again, there is a treatment that's recommended for six to 12 weeks with itraconazole. Medias, uh, fibrosing mediastinitis, it's rare, but it's a progressive fibrotic condition which can cause significant um, lung disease and debility, especially if um, bilateral <coughs> lungs are involved. Um, there is actually no um, antifungal treatment that is recommended, but there aren't any um, large prospective studies with long-term follow-up that, uh, that predict outcomes in these patients. But in general, the authorities believe that antifungals are not effective in these patients. The only treatment recommendation um, that is out there is about stenting um, with patients who have symptoms of obstruction of pulmonary arteries or veins. Stent placement has been successful. Um, however, if they have um, in, uh, irritation of the airways, placement of stent in the airways is actually discouraged because um, it granulation tissue often invades the stent causing further obstruction in the airways and then the stents can be very difficult to remove should obstruction develop. Surgery is not recommended for patients who have um, fibrosing mediastinitis because there's a high operative mortality rate and a limited benefit. There was a review of 71 patients who had fibrosing mediastinitis who had occlusion of major major central airways and only 40% benefited and up to 20% died as a result of the surgery. Um, if patients have broncholiths, there's really no treatment for that, and pulmonary nodules, there's no treatment for that, but these are things that need to be monitored. Do you know what the level of evidence is behind the idea of treating patients in symptomatic Um, I did not write that down. I think a lot of this on the sequelae um, was expert opinion, it was that level. Um, I didn't write it down specifically, but there, like I said, there were no like long-term trials where they're monitoring patients over time to see the recovery and with or without treatment, so it looked like it was mostly expert opinion. So moving on now, and I apologize, I'm going fast, but there's a lot. So um, to blastomycosis, this is also known as Gilchrist disease or Chicago disease. It was first described by Thomas Gilchrist in 1894 caused by Blastomyces dermatitidis, which is a broad-based budding yeast, which is, are these pictures. Um, it's also thermally dimorphic. It morphs into a yeast in the body. It also lives in the environment in the soil and wet areas where there's decaying organic matter like wood and leaves, so anywhere that's near water. It does grow indoors as well in very damp areas. The location is also worldwide, but especially common in Central and South America. In North America, there is a, a broader region of um, where it's endemic, from northern Ontario into parts of Canada, through the Appalachian Mountains, into m the Midwest, and also the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. Again, the CDC says this is a reportable disease in the following states, and again, Michigan falls on this list. Um, risk factors for developing blastomycosis is just living in an endemic area and participating in activities where you could be exposed to, to, the, to, the, um, to blastomycosis. So farmers, forestry workers, people who hunt and camp, basically anyone. Um, this is another map from the CDC that shows the distribution, so a bit wider than um, histoplasmosis, and we definitely fall in this region here in Michigan. The transmission of the blasto is similar to histo. It's inhalation of the aerosolized spores. So patients who um, have been disturbing soil or leaves or rotting woods, that's when they're at risk for inhaling these spores. The incubation period is variable. It's been reported anywhere from three weeks to three months after inhalation. And the spectrum of disease is also variable. Patients can be asymptomatic in up to 50% of cases, but they can progress to severe pulmonary and extrapulmonary disease. So the pulmonary disease, there's an acute and a chronic pneumonia, and then extra pulmonary disease, um, there is up to 50% of patients who have chronic pulmonary blasto also have extra pulmonary disease, and it's the result of hematogenous spread to other sites, and it's reported to involve almost every organ. 
Again, because of a nonspecific presentation, the differential should include anything from viral and typical pneumonia to TB, histo, and certain cancers. This is the same map that we had shown before. Um, so it is the second most common mycosis causing hospitalization. The annual incidence is reported to be one to two cases per 100,000 people in endemic areas. So for mortality, the overall mortality is uh, reported to be four to six percent, but it can be as high as 18 to 20 percent in patients who have CNS blastomycosis and as high as 89 percent in reports in patients who also have ARDS. Um, patients who are immunocompromised are obviously the ones that have the higher mortality rates and they can be as high as in general up to 25 percent. Diagnosis, again, you need to have a thorough history with um, appropriate exposure and risk factors for disease. Um, culturing, um, you will see thick-walled spherical yeast with single buds and a broad base of attachment between the bud and the parent cell, and that's what this picture shows. Um, pulmonary disease, there is actually a high yield of um, diagnosis on culture from sputum and VAL samples. Histopathology, you will just see some kind of granulomatous tissue response, nothing particularly specific. And then um, antigen detection um, is available. The sensitivity is reported to be 89%, especially in disseminated blasto, and 93% overall. Sensitivity is higher in the urine than in the serum, but the specificity is only 79%. And that's, and that's usually because of um, cross-reactivity um, with uh, histoplasmosis. There is, um, PCR is not routinely available. There are some reports that it's like an experimental phase, it's very expensive, so it's really not routinely available. And serology is not useful because of this high cross-reactivity with other mycoses, especially histo. So for the acute pneumonia, it's often self-limited. It can, um, symptoms can last for two to three weeks and sometimes patients get better. A lot of times they present with a cough that's initially non-productive but then can progress to purulent. Fever, chest pain, shortness of breath, weight loss, chills, nothing that will really kind of concern you of thinking of something else than a run-of-the-mill pneumonia. Um, imaging in the acute phase, uh, chest x-ray, alveolar infiltrates, pleural effusions are common, but patients can also have miliary or reticular nodular patterns. I don't know how clear that came up on that chest x-ray on the right, but that's kind of a um, miliary pattern, miliary nodules all over the place. Um, for CT, um, nodules, consolidation with or without cavitation, tree and bud, pleural effusions are all common. Um, Lack of mediastinal lymphadenopathy is sometimes the key to differentiating blastomycosis from histo, although it can still happen. Um, this CT on the bottom here is just showing um, some nodules, a significant infiltrate on the left, and then um, some small tree and bud opacities. For the chronic pneumonia, symptoms often last over a month. Patients often receive multiple courses of antibiotics for bacterial pneumonia before they're diagnosed appropriately. It's clinically similar to TB, bronchogenic carcinoma, and other fungal infections. So again, like I had mentioned before, we have to keep those on our differential. The symptoms are, again, non too, not too specific. Low-grade fever, productive cough, hemoptysis, chest pain, weight loss. Imaging uh, for the chronic findings, alveolar infiltrates, they may also have cavitary lesions. Um, and they're typically upper lobe predominant. Patients can present with also ARDS. It is rare, um, but it does have a very high mortality rate. Um, there was a study out of University of Mississippi Medical Center where it is endemic. Um, 123 patients that were treated for blasto, 107 of them had lung involvement and nine of them um, had ARDS. Seven of the nine actually died of respiratory failure. So if patients do have ARDS, it's a very high mortality. Um, they, extra pulmonary blastomycosis is most likely associated with the chronic pulmonary disease. The skin is the second most commonly infected organ. Um, these pictures are showing the typical lesion. It's a verrucous wart-like lesion with irregular borders of microabscesses. This can often be confused with squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Um, the actual organisms, the blastomyces organisms, can be identified by biopsying along the periphery of these microabscesses. They can also get some subcutaneous nodules 
Other um, areas of involvement, although it's reported in almost every organ, the other most common ones are bone and joint in up to a quarter of patients who have multi-organ disease. Um, osteomyelitis is the usual presentation. These patients can have chronic draining sinus tracts and osteolytic lesions on imaging. Um, for the GU system, for males, prostatitis and epididymal artitis have been reported. There are rare cases in females of tubo ovarian abscess or endometritis, and there's actually one case report of a woman who acquired blastomycosis from sexual transmission from a man who had disseminated disease. Um, for CNS involvement, it's uncommon in the immunocompetent, but in our immunocompromised patients, meningitis, epidural abscess, abscess and intracranial abscesses um, that tend to favor the cerebellum are, are, are common. For the treatment, um, again, IDSA guidelines in 2008, they recommend all patients with blasto should be treated regardless of the clinical presentation because of a high likelihood of progression or recurrence if not treated. For the acute pneumonia, um, because of the um, kind of nonspecific presentation, a lot of patients are not caught at this time and they're usually treated for a regular bacterial pneumonia, um, but there have been reports of spontaneous resolution, although the frequency is not known. For the chronic pneumonia and extrapulmonary disease, they do require treatment. For mild disease, um, patients who do not need hospitalization, you can start with the itraconazole load and continue with itraconazole for a total of six to 12 months of treatment. For moderate to severe disease, patients who present far more sick and require hospitalization, again, there's an amphotericin B load for the first two weeks and then step down therapy to itraconazole. And this requires 12 months of therapy. If patients have CNS involvement, um, there is a higher amphotericin load and for a longer duration of four to six weeks, followed by the itraconazole to complete the 12-month regimen. If patients are persistently immunosuppressed, they do have an increased risk for relapse and recurrence. So continuation of therapy um, with the itraconazole while Im on immunosuppression is recommended. Moving on to coccidiomycosis, we probably don't see this too much. It's more on the west side. Um, it's also known as valley fever, California fever, desert rheumatism, and San Joaquin Valley fever. Um, it was described by Wernicke and Posadas um, in 1892. In South America, there was an Argentinian soldier who actually had cutaneous manifestations, and then two years later in the US, um, it was described in a patient in California with disseminated disease. It's caused by Coccidioides imitis, which is the, the type that's found in California, and Coccidioides posidasi, which is found in the other areas in the US. Although they are um, structurally slightly different, um, they have the same spectrum of disease. It's also a dimorphic fungus. It's a spherule in the host. It lives in the soil. It's most common in southwestern US, parts of Mexico, Central, and South America. Um, in the U.S., it's endemic, especially in South Arizona and the San Joaquin Valley in California. It's uh, also a reportable disease, according to the CDC, mostly on the west side, but if it happens, if we happen to catch somebody here, it is reportable in Michigan. Um, risk factors for severe disease are, again, immunosuppression, so HIV, AIDS patients, as post organ transplant, TNF inhibitors. Pregnant women and diabetics are actually on the list um, for the CDC. So this is a map from them as well, showing the areas that are endemic, at least in the US. So those two darkest green, the one in California, that's the San, San Joaquin Valley, and then the South Arizona. Transmission is the same as the other mycoses. It's inhalation. Um, typically, patients um, have had disturbance of contaminated soil. So when there's construction or excavation, or if there are dust storms out in the desert over there, or earthquakes. Incubation is seven to 21 days after inhalation. And the spectrum of disease, again, can be anywhere from asymptomatic in 60% of patients to severe disease. And again, the differential um, is broad. When patients are presenting, you still need to think about common things like flu and pneumonia, but sarcoid, lymphoma, lung cancer, and the other fungal infections should be considered. Um, for the overall incidence, so this is a, um, also from the CDC report in 2011, 42 cases per 100,000 population. So maybe a little bit more common than we think. Um, I'm not sure exactly why there are so many more cases, particularly in 2011, if that's just because um, people are more aware of it, so diagnosis is higher, or if there were more cases for any other particular reason. I don't know if there was an earthquake there or something. 
Um, but Arizona has the most, followed by California and then the other states. Um, this same map that we had seen before, again, it's the third most common uh, mycosis causing hospitalization. Um, mortality rate is reported to be low as 0.07%, but it is most common in patients with disseminated disease or who are immunosuppressed. Um, there's a study that's reported on the CDC page um, that had um, 3,000 patients, uh, 3,000 coccidioides associated deaths that were listed as the primary contributing cause on the death certificate in the U.S. from 1990 to 2008, which is an average of less than 200 deaths per year. So in general, it seems like the um, mortality rate is a bit lower. Um, the diagnosis, again, um, you need to have appropriate exposure and risk factors. On culture, you'll see branch branching septated hyphae, um, which is the upper picture, and those are supposed to look like barrels, I suppose so. Um, and on tissue or sputum samples, oftentimes it's difficult to obtain sputum samples because patients don't always have a, a productive cough, but if you do have a tissue sample, you will see the spherules in the tissue, um, which is the second picture. For serology, um, there are three different assays. There is an uh, EIA, which is very sensitive and it's commonly used for diagnosis. There's an immunodiffusion, which detects the IgM antibodies, so these are positive early in infection. And there's a complement fixation, um, which detects the IgG antibodies, so this is often used to assess the disease severity and monitoring over time. For the acute infection, or the primary pulmonary infection, um, again, patients kind of present with nonspecific symptoms that last weeks to months, and it's known as the valley fever phase. Um, these patients have fatigue, cough, shortness of breath, night sweats, they may have a rash that looks like erythema nodosum. They may present with a pneumonia, and it's also similar to the other mycoses, is often misdiagnosed as community-acquired pneumonia. Um, there's a report out of Pima County um, in Arizona, which is in South Arizona, where 29% of the patients who were diagnosed with CAP were actually serologically positive for, for coxie. Um, if they have hemoptysis on presentation, that is often suggestive of formation of a pulmonary cavity. On imaging for chest x-ray, they often just have low bar consolidation, which is in that top picture, or they can have multifocal consolidation and nodules with adenopathy, as you can see in the bottom too. For the disseminated disease, this usually happens in immunosuppressed patients. Um, other than the lungs, the other sites of involvement are skin, and again, I had already mentioned erythema nodosum, but they can also have ulcers, nodules, abscesses. CNS involvement is meningitis, and patients can have permanent neurological deficits, and bone involvement is also osteomyelitis and lytic lesions, although there are reports of involvement of essentially every other organ in the body. Chronic lung findings, you'll see nodules, chronic cavities, persistent pneumonias, kind of a terrible looking CT scan. Treatment from the IDSA, um, this is their guidelines from 2005. Azolt are actually the um, drug of choice. Um, it's recommended for primary pulmonary infection in high-risk patients and then absolutely in patients with disseminated disease. The only FDA-approved drug for COXI is actually ketoconazole, 400 milligrams, although it's less in favor for, be uh, for being used for treatment because of the wide side effect profile. Patients can have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, QT prolongation. There are also reports of significant hepatotoxicity leading to liver transplant. So ketoconazole, although it is approved, is not usually the drug of choice. Um, the mycosis study group actually did some large perspective clinical trials using fluconazole and itraconazole. Um, for the fluconazole, it was a multi-center um, study, although they only had 78 patients enrolled. 42% um, had soft tissue involvement, 42 had chronic pulmonary, and 14 had um, bone and joint involvement, and they were treated with fluconazole. And overall, there was a report of 86% um, treatment cure in the patients who had skin and soft tissue involvement, 55% um, improvement with pulmonary, and 76% um, in the um, bone involvement. So. Although these numbers are kind of marginal, in general, there's like a high relapse rate. So with the less side effect profile with um, fluconazole, it is one of them that is recommended. The other study um, using ibuprofenazole, um, this only had 51 patients in it, and these are for non-meningeal patients. 
Um, and they also had, in general, a 57% uh, remission rate with a low side effect profile. So those tend to be the two drugs that are used more commonly. Um, there are no studies comparing azole to amphotericin B. Amphotericin B is not listed as one of the treatment modalities for it, although there are reports where it's used in conjunction when patients have severe cases. Um, out of some of these studies and from the IDSA, it's just noted that if patients have skeletal involvement, it tends to be more itraconazole responsive. Uh, and, and then pulmonary and CNS involvement, it seems to be more fluconazole involvement. And if there is CNS involvement, fluconazole is the drug of choice. The minimum duration of therapy is at least for six months, but it usually can be longer um, because you have to monitor for resolution of symptoms, regression of radiographic abnormalities, and improvement in the complement fixation titers. Um, in immunosuppressed patients with meningeal involvement actually require lifelong therapy. So this is the last one I actually did not know about, Cryptococcus gaudi. It's caused by Cryptococcus gaudi, which is uh, formerly known as um, Cryptoneoformans variation gaudi. It's an encapsulated yeast. Um, it's differentiated by from Cryptoneoformans by using a particular auger. This is L-cannabinine glycine bromothymol. Um, Gaudi will change it from its regular color of yellow green to blue, and then Neoformans doesn't cause a color change. Um, this yeast lives in the soil. It's a very uh, strong association with trees, in particular a eucalyptus tree, pine, American sweet gum, and this pohutukuwa. I don't know what kind of tree this is. Um, the location is mostly in tropical and subtropical regions of the world, especially Australia, Papua New Guinea, parts of Africa, Asia, Europe, Mexico, essentially everywhere, but Australia and Papua New Guinea were where the first reports were. Um, in North America, since 1999, there have been reports of um, finding this in the Vancouver and uh, Vancouver Island, and then in the Pacific Northwest, Oregon and Washington particularly, since 2004. So it is a reportable disease according to the CDC in Oregon and Washington. Risk factors for this disease, anyone can acquire disease from exposure, but it's more common in the immunosuppressed patients or patients who have underlying lung disease, age over 50, and smokers. So this is the map, again, um, showing it's in the Pacific Northwest. They are actually including California in this now as well. Transmission is, again, inhalation of the dried yeast cells or spores from the environment. Incubation, because this one is a little bit newer, there's not as much information, so it's not really well established. It's been reported as early as a symptom manifestation as two months, up to 13 months after breathing in the fungus, with an average of six to seven months. The spectrum of disease, it typically involves just the lung and the CNS. And again, the differential, you do need to think of the under other mycoses, TB, malignancy. Um, overall, incidence is low. The CDC summary from 20, 2004, when it was first reported in the US until 2010, only identified 60 cases. Um, but if anybody's gonna go work in the Pacific Northwest, you need to think about it. Um, mortality, again, because we don't have a lot of data, there's kind of a wide range. From reports from Australia to us in the low amount of cases, it ranges anywhere from 13 to 33%. Diagnosis, again, you need your history and risk factors. For antigen testing, you test the blood or the CSF and it identifies um, cryptococcal infection, but it does not differentiate. You do have to culture it on that auger, as I mentioned. So this is a picture. Um, it's normally this yellow-green color, but Cryptococcus gaudi will turn it blue. And you should be culturing, testing BAL, um, FNAs, or lung biopsy for pulmonary disease and CSF analysis. Sometimes brain biopsy is required. For the pulmonary manifestations, there's a pneumonia-like illness, fever, cough, dyspnea, chest pain. Imaging will show pulmonary nodules, ill-defined infiltrates, or it can have these cryptococcomas, which are these fungal kind of encapsulated growths, kind of like in aspergilloma, I guess. Um, for the CNS involvement, patients usually have meningitis, the fever, headache, altered mental status are typical findings. They can also have the cryptococcomas, which are these fungal growths, and that's what this MRI is showing here. In pictures A and B, these are the cryptococcomas, and then in C and D, um, these are showing improvements of those previous findings after treatment. The patients are still on treatment at this time, but it does show a rapid improvement. So for the treatment, um, IDSA guidelines came out in 2010. For the CNS disease, they require induction therapy with amphotericin high dose plus glucidocine. 
for four to six weeks, followed by fluconazole 400 QD for a total of 18 months. Patients do require monitoring with repeat lumbar puncture after two weeks to assess response. If the CSF cultures are still positive, you should continue the induction therapy with the amphotericin before stepping down to fluconazole and continue to do lumbar punctures Q2 weeks until the CSF is sterile. Um, if there is cerebral edema or neurodeficits, steroids, similar to any other, um, any other <coughs> CNS treatment that we do. If there's isolated pulmonary disease, or if we think it's isolated pulmonary disease, the IDSA still recommends to do an LP to rule out any CNS involvement because the treatment is different. If it is isolated pulmonary disease, you can start right away with the fluconazole and go for six to 12 months and again or longer if there's resolu until a resolution of imaging findings. Um, but if there are these cryptococcomas in the lungs or the patients are immunocompromised, the IDSA does recommend that you actually do the CNS treatment. And if there are these um, large cryptococcomas that are causing significant disease burden, they may require surgical resection, but there are no formal guidelines about which patients we should refer um, for that. And that is it. I don't know if Dr. Morris, do we have any? Do it fast. <laughs> do you have any other comments for it? It's a lot of information. I did it quick. Sorry. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so just something to think about. So anybody who just comes in with pneumonia, just ask them if they've been camping or something. <laughs> 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 These are all